Philip Wolf. Thank you very much, Dr. Otteson. Uh, it was in the spring of 1958 that I got into our old car in Washington, D.C. I was working at Walter Reed and drove over to Baltimore to have a discussion with Torsten Weasel and Stephen Kufler about what research we would do. We had, uh, I was to go there in June. Uh, I had been at Walter Reed uh, in the Army for three years doing research mostly on sleep, and I wanted to study the differences in single cells in cats uh, when they woke up and went to sleep, uh, cortical cells. And b partly, I think, because it was easiest, uh, there's less muscle in the way, I put my electrodes in the visual cortex, which is close to the midline in the cat. And having done so, I was amazed to find out that the, these uh, supposedly visual cells, certainly in the primary visual cortex, uh, there was no doubt about the placement of the electrode, they refused to respond by and large. When one shined a, a light into the face of the animal, the uh, cells simply ignored the stimulus. And gradually I began to be able to vaguely uh, make some of the cells respond by waving my hands, but it was very hard to pin down uh, just what stimulus these cells needed. Uh, I had planned to go and work in Vernon Mountcastle's lab at Johns Hopkins Hospital, but at the time that I was supposed to go there, in, the, in this uh, early summer of 1958, he was remodeling the rooms of his laboratory, and it wasn't a convenient time. And one day, Stephen Kufler called and, and said, since Vernon won't, be, uh, won't have finished his remodeling for the next eight months or so, how would you like to come and work with Torsten Weasel, who needs a collaborator, and uh, see what you can get done in that short length of time? Well, I jumped at the chance, because I had met Torsten before. He had come over to look at my electrodes, which incidentally were fine for the cortex, but were absolutely useless in the retina, as it turned out. But I knew that Torsten knew the technique for stimulating uh, and for the for stimulating retina, and uh, knew all about receptive fields, which was uh, absolutely new to me. So I, I accepted with alacrity and started in in June of '58. Well, it, it, would be, it became obvious. I remember coming home one night and telling Ruth, my wife, that this collaboration really seems to be marvelous. And Torsten and I get along well. We understand each other. And we've started to work right away. We did our first experiment within the first week or so. And inside of three months, we had enough information to write our first paper, which is the paper that David Otteson just referred to. I think we always had a feeling of, of haste in those days because my time was limited to eight months, as, as I've said. It turned out that 22 years later, we're still, uh, I don't know whether one should think of this as left and right hemisphere, rather more, I kind of tend to think of it more like two oxen pulling a plow or something like that, if it happens to be, has to be a dual system. Well, what, what uh, I would like to, I've already mentioned that one of the big attractions, of course, to going to Hopkins was Stephen Kufler, who had worked out the uh, properties of retinal ganglion cells following in the wake of, of Professor Granite here, uh, had determined the center surround organization of the receptive fields of retinal ganglion cells. Uh, Stephen Kufler was a marvelous person, and he encouraged us constantly. He never preached or instructed, but he, he uh, by his enthusiasm, made us aware when we had done something uh, worthwhile. And by his, his vagueness and uh, um, neutrality, if you like, uh, he made us it, it quite clear that he didn't consider something interesting. So that was a very good guide. Uh, the, after three months, at about the time we were about to write our first paper, I discovered, we had been discovering gradually, my wife and I, that we were getting poorer and poorer, and, and we had not been paid. And I remember going to Stephen Kufler's office, uh, finally getting up the courage and, and telling him I don't seem to be getting any money. And he leaned back and laughed and laughed and said, I forgot. <laughs> and the, <laughs> the, uh, the first slide shows a picture of Stephen Kufler uh, in his office 
exactly as he appeared when I went in that day and, and complained that I wasn't getting any money. Uh, when Torsten and I wrote our first abstract, it, it took us days to prepare that abstract. We found writing it at first very difficult, and uh, we gave our abstract to Steve to uh, look over. And I remember coming in the next day, uh, Torsten looked more gloomy even than usual. And <laughs> said, I guess Steve didn't like our abstract very much. Well, the second slide shows a picture of, of the abstract uh, after corrections by <laughs> <laughs> Steve and Kufler. There, not only are there more, more words on the abstract than we had originally put there, but some of the terminology that Steve introduced in correcting this abstract has survived even to the present day. And we have this framed hanging up to, to show students that they shouldn't be too depressed when we correct their <laughs> material. Well, what, I, what I would like to do this afternoon is start by uh, giving uh, two examples of what it is like to be there while we're doing an experiment to attempt to give you the flavor of what these cells, how these cells behave that we've been studying. First, I want to give an example of a, a typical Kuflerian center surround uh, cell in the cat retina. This is retinal ganglion cell, and actually the recording was made from the optic nerve. And, this, and secondly, uh, one of the simpler types of cells in the cat's primary visual cortex. So let me start by just describing what the experimental setup is. And if we could have the next slide. This shows a diagram of uh, one of our experiments. We have a monkey here in a head holder. The monkey is anesthetized, and it also has to be paralyzed, otherwise the eyes move around. And we want the eyes to be stable uh, in order to have a stable image on the retina. To produce that, we take an ordinary slide projector and direct spots and patterns onto a screen, which is kept at about one and a half meters from the monkey. And, uh, we, uh, when visitors come, of course, we have more sophisticated methods of stimulation and we turn those on, TV and things like that, but then when they go away, we get back out the slide projector, <laughs> which is much more convenient. And in, to record, we simply drill a hole into the, in the animal's skull and insert a microelectrode in whatever structure we want to record from, the optic nerve, the lateral geniculate, the primary visual cortex, or other cortical areas. Uh, in order to make a record, we take a videotape, a video camera, and direct it at the screen so that when we play back the uh, tape, we can, hear, we can see what the animal would have seen if it had, if it, if it had been awake. And in order to make a record of the responses, we take the output of the microelectrode, which uh, is connected to amplifiers and to an, os an oscilloscope, and we uh, connect that to the soundtrack of the tape so that when we play back, we can hear the cells firing. When one records from a single cell, one hears a single impulse as a click. And if the cell is, is firing very vigorously, the clicks tend to merge and one hears a noise. And you'll hear that sort of thing in a few minutes. Uh, then by taking the videotape and sending it to New York and paying enough money, one can have a movie made of it. And that's what you will see now. So the, the first example is uh, from a center surround uh, typical on-center cell uh, in, in the cat. And just perhaps to remind you, the center surround receptive field that you will be seeing is ex excitatory in the center and inhibitory in the surround. And measured on the retina, this center diameter would be something less, uh, much less than a millimeter, perhaps a quarter or, uh, of a millimeter or even less and the surround perhaps uh, several millimeters. And translated into, into degrees, uh, this center region might be a quarter of a degree and the surround three or four degrees. The moon subtends half a degree. Uh, now what you'll see when the film starts is a spot moving on the screen up and down and back and forth and we're hunting for the center of the receptive field as the animal looks at the screen. And when we cross over that center region, you will hear a brisk discharge, like a machine gun. So we lock the slide projector in that position and turn the light off and on. And you hear every time the light goes on, the cell fires faster. If we make the spot large, we still get a discharge when the light goes on, but it's a, a very disappointing discharge, very weak in comparison with what one sees to a small spot. 
And then we can stimulate the surround of the receptive field, and you see that the activity of the cell, the spontaneous ongoing activity of the cell, is suppressed when the light goes on. And when the light goes off, as well to make up for lost time, there's a discharge, which is called the off discharge. And then we can perform various parlor tricks, and we do so here. And the uh, purpose of that is just to show that any kind of stimulus you use, can be the response can be more or less predicted from this geometry of the center surround. So that, for instance, if you use a long, narrow slit that covers all of the center and only a small fraction of the surround, you get a response that's almost as vigorous as a small spot. Or perhaps we can see the first film example. We need sound. This is the behavior in an, an animal like the cat or the monkey of the great majority of cells that come into the primary visual cortex. If one repeats this experiment in the lateral geniculate body, the intermediate station between the eyes and the cortex, one finds almost identical responses. So it's in this form that the information arrives at the cortex. And when Torsten and C Steve Kufler and I sat in the cafeteria at Johns Hopkins and discussed what we would do, it was clear that the uh, most interesting thing to do then was to go up to the cortex and record from single cells and see if we could influence the cells and ask ourselves how they would behave. And that was the strategy that we decided on. But it was absolutely not clear what we could expect to find in the cortex. The cortex at that point was regarded as something which uh, contains a systematic topographic map of the visual world. But in trying to guess what the cortex would do with the information that came into it, the best people could come up with was the vague notion that it analyzed things. But it was never quite clear what anyone meant when they said analyze things. Well, now we have a fair idea of what the cells in the primary visual cortex do. As you'll see by the time I'm finished, this doesn't give us an idea how perception works or how we recognize faces. It doesn't come close to that, but it does tell us that the cortex this part of the cortex is doing something that can be understood and seems to make sense in terms of dissecting the visual world and further analyzing it. So let's look and see some of the things that it does. Now, what I want to show in the second example is what's what we call a simple cell in the striate cortex. And it differs profoundly from what you've just seen. One can still map out the receptive field of such a cell into excitatory and inhibitory regions, into plus regions, and if you like, we use triangles to denote inhibition. But the geometry is entirely different. And there are several kinds of geometries in single cells. The example that I'll show con consists of 
uh, a discrete region on the retina or in the visual field that's subdivided into excita excitatory area and inhibitory. But the excita excitatory and inhibitory regions are separated not by a circle, but by parallel straight lines. There's a sort of side-by-side -side arrangement. And the result of this is that this the stimulus that works best by far on these cells is a line stimulus in a particular specific orientation which depends on the cell. And the kind of line that works best depends on this geometry. In the example, you'll see the sort of line that works best, which is the commonest type, is a white line on a dark background. So if we could just go ahead and look at the next example. Here we see very little response. It turns out that the inhibitory area is spread out and we have to make the stimulus fatter in order to get a response. But when we do that, you, you see a typical off response suggesting that this is an inhibitory area. There isn't enough spontaneous firing in this cell to make it clear that firing is suppressed. But the off discharge is the major indication that this is inhibitory. Now, in the upper region, the, res the effect isn't as strong. One has only one, one miserable impulse each time the light is turned off. But that suggests that this is probably inhibitory, and we mark tentatively some triangles to indicate that. This is almost like an acid-base titration uh, in its precision of balance. And you see this best when one uses diffuse light or a large spot. This is the reason the cells I recorded from at Walter Reed didn't seem to respond. I was simply using crude stimuli like this one. And as you see, the cell can't be bothered with anything that simple. It's a, it's a specialist. This shows that the upper region is doing something because when one includes it, one sees no response. That's fine. Well, th this is the, th one of the simplest types of cells that one sees in the primary visual cortex. In the monkey, there are simpler cells still. There are cells, as I'll point out later, wh which give responses that are practically identical to geniculate cells or retinal ganglion cells. That is, they have this same circular symmetry. And then one sees these cells, which we call simple. And there are two types that are still more complicated, called complex and hypercomplex.
No, no the, all of these cells, uh, the simple complex and hypercomplex, share the, the quality that they require to give a, a response, a line in a particular orientation, either a dark line on a light background or a light line or an edge boundary between dark and light, some kind of line, the orientation of which has to be closely specified if one is to see any response at all. One can, I, I don't have time to go into the, qual, the uh, description of the complex and hypercomplex cells, but they work, uh, each one works as if it got input from a lot of cells of the, uh, of the type before. That is, complex cells work uh, in such a way that you can understand their behavior by assuming that they get input from a, many simple cells all having the same orientation. And the hypercomplex, uh, it looks as though they work uh, in a way that could be explained by supposing that they get input from many complex cells all with the same stimulus orientation. And the point of this is that the entire physiology of the primary visual cortex gives us to believe that one has a high degree of connectivity between cells in the same orientation. And there's no reason to think that there should be very much uh, interconnection between cells that respond to different orientations of lines. And this, as you, you'll see in a few minutes, turns out to be a rather important consideration. Now, so far, I have said nothing about the fact that the animal has two eyes. One could have seen these same responses if uh, one had had one eye closed in the animal and just the other eye open. And there is a whole chapter of this, uh, of this subject which concerns binocular interaction, but maybe one can reduce it to, uh, to its elements just by considering, first of all, in the monkey, about half of the cells can be uh, stimulated independently from either eye. The other half are monocular, that is, they respond only to the left eye or, or only to the right eye. But if one has a binocular cell, then one can ask a, an interesting question. One can say, uh, let us map out the receptive field in the left eye and then do the same in the right eye and compare the two and see what, if any, the difference is. And I think that's the result of that's illustrated on the next slide, which in fact I may not have included. Uh, this is just uh, 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 another illustration of our experimental setup, and the next slide shows an electrode in place in the brain, uh, brain stained by Golgi to, uh, uh, techniques to give you an idea of the relative size of the electrode in a single cell that the electrode might be recording from. Could we have the next? Yes, uh, supposing now this is the screen and this is the center of gaze and one is recording from the right hemisphere so one outlines the receptive field of the cell in the left visual field and suppose that the cell as seen as mapped in the left eye has its re receptive field here and let's suppose the best orientation just like the cell you saw in the example is like this and it could per perhaps respond to movement up and to the left, but not to movement down on the right and to the right, which is characteristic of many complex cells. Now, if one maps it out in this way in the left eye, then one, one can close the left eye, open the right eye, and repeat the experiment. And in that case, you find that the receptive field is in exactly the same part of, of the animal's visual field, uh, and the orientation is the same, and any other peculiarities like responding to one direction and not to the other. Uh, any other peculiarity is the same. So everything you find by way of the left eye, you can reproduce by way of the right eye, suggesting that the cell is receiving a duplicate set of connections from the two eyes. N not only does one have fancy and intricate connections from one eye, but a carbon copy from the other. Now, if you compare the responses to stimulating the left and right eyes, they are not necessarily the same. Many of the cells, as I've said, half are monocular, and in that case, only one eye works at all. But even among binocular cells, uh, as a rule, one eye, one eye gives better responses than the other, and one has a kind of continuum of cells uh, all the way from cells that respond only to the left eye through equality to cells that only re respond to the right eye. And as Torsen will describe uh, in his talk, we have a system for grading cells according to their eye preference. But eye preference is another characteristic of cells that one can speak of. So you see even now that uh, when you talk about these cells, there are a number of characteristics. 
there's the position of the receptive field in the visual field, whether it's in the left visual field or in the right, and exactly where it's located. There's the orientation of the line that works best, and there is eye preference. And finally, complexity, whether the cell's simple complex or hyper complex. And we have spent a lot of time in the last 10 or 15 years asking ourselves how cells are distributed in the cortex, whether they're distributed at random or whether there's any pattern. And it turns out that there are a series of interlocking patterns and a rather aesthetically pleasing arrangement. Uh, this is what David Otteson was speaking about, the columns in, in a church. They're not exactly like columns in a church, as you'll see, but uh, th they are fun to study, and we have spent some time doing so. So let us just address that problem and look at the arrangement of these cells in the cortex. And to do that, I have to introduce some, some rather, what might seem at first some rather boring anatomy. One can't get around these things though, and it's good to have some solid, uh, concrete idea of what the structure uh, that we're dealing with, the, the, the striate cortex, what it actually looks like. So the next few slides uh, deal with this. Uh, this is uh, a macaque monkey the brain looked at from behind, and this is the occipital lobe, and the primary visual cortex extends over most of the uh, exposed surface of the occipital lobe and tucks in medially in a series of complex folds that are buried and, and can't be seen. The size of the entire primary visual cortex is something, uh, uh, in modern terminology, is roughly the size of a credit card. And if you now... Uh, it, as I've already mentioned, the visual world is mapped onto this structure in, in a high degree of topographic order. So if this is the left occipital lobe, it deals with the right half of the visual world. The center of gaze projects here, uh, in other words, the foveas of the two retinas. And as you move in this direction, you're moving uh, out into the right uh, visual field along the horizon. If you go this way, you go down in the visual field. If you go along this way, you go up. Now, the map is highly systematic, but it isn't uniform. There's a disproportionate representation of the foveal region, as has been known for 50 years or more. Uh, and it works out that if you move one millimeter along the cortex in this region, in the foveal region, you're moving something like a sixth of a degree in the visual field. Whereas if you move a millimeter in the far periphery, you go something like six degrees. So there's a vast difference in, in, uh, in the uh, precision of representation of the visual world. Now, you can get an idea of what the whole cortex looks like by making a cross-section. I, I, as I say in, in the USA, uh, for the sake of psychologists, this is not what the brain looks like when it came out of the skull. We put this here. And if you walk into this region and look to the left, you see a cross-section of the cortex. And that's shown on the next slide. Here is the visual cortex, the primary visual or striate cortex. You can see why, why it's called striate because of the high degree of layering. And this, if you come out of the plane of the board and go back in, this is the folded underneath part, which is continuous. So this would be somewhere near the foveal representation, and this would be the far periphery. And you can see right away that the, the uh, cortex is a very a uniform structure. It's just about the same thickness everywhere. It looks a little thicker here, but this is an oblique section. And that comes as a, as a surprise, first of all because of this non-uniformity that I talked about, the physiological non-uniformity, the one-sixth of a degree as opposed to six degrees. And there's another respect in which it's very non-uniform. If you record from cells here, you find that their receptive fields are very small. You remember in the example I showed, the receptive field was about this big. Uh, in the foveal region, on the same scale, the receptive field might be about that big. And in the far periphery, it might be the size of the whole blackboard. And so you can see that the, the world is analyzed in, uh, in a way that is very variable in terms of its precision. One is forming a precise analysis of the world in the center region. Uh, it requires many more cells, and each cell deals with a tiny part of the visual world. And the reverse is true out in the periphery. So 
more area is devoted to a certain part of the visual field in the center region by far than in the peripheral region. Now these two things, the, the difference in the size of the receptive fields in the center and the periphery, and the non-uniformity of magnification of, of topographic representation, the one-sixth degree versus six degrees, these things are interlocked in a very aesthetically pleasing way. So let me just describe how that works. If you make a penetration through the cortex, recording from one cell after the next, and map out all of their receptive fields, you find the maps are practically superimposed. There's a little random variation, but it looks something like that. If you move across this way, not surprisingly, you find that superimposed on this random scatter, you have a drift of receptive field position in a direction that's dictated by the topographic map. And it turns out that if you go something like two millimeters across the cortex, that is just about enough to get you from where you started to an entirely new region. And that holds true wherever you do this in the visual field. If you repeat the experiment in the foveal region, up here. You start with very small receptive fields, and once you've gone two millimeters, you've gone into an entirely different region. If you repeat it in the far periphery, you start here and you move here. So wherever you go, one millimeter is about enough to take care of a certain part of the visual field, and the size of that part differs. But now you begin to see that the uniformity of the cortex is something that is, is a a much deeper thing than one's superficial impression just looking at, at a histological slide. The machinery in the cortex uh, that is analyzing a certain part of the visual field must be the same everywhere. And the, any given region of cortex doesn't know what's coming into it. It does the same job in a stereotyped way and puts out a result in the form of orientation specificity and so forth. But everything that goes on in the cortex must go on within one millimeter, otherwise it's too late. Now, I'll, I'll bring this uh, back to your attention in a few minutes, but it's also interesting to know that the connections in the cortex laterally are not very extensive, and most cells don't send axons for more than one millimeter or two. So that also seems to fit. Well, now let us just look at a few of these variables that I've talked about. For instance, receptive field orientation. If you make a penetration through the cortex vertically and look at the receptive field orientation of many cells, if the first one, if the first cell requires a line with that sort of tilt, then all of the cells through the full thickness of cortex will require the same direction of line, almost certainly. You have to have an absolutely perpendicular penetration to see this. If you make a penetration recording from cell after cell, in this direction, parallel to the layers, then if this is the orientation of the first cell, you find a stepwise change in orientation so that a movement of about 50 microns is enough to change the orientation something like 10 degrees. But it's a highly systematic pattern uh, arrangement of cells. Now, the next slide shows a piece of cortex like this at higher magnification. And I just want to point out that the geniculate fibers, as they come in, mostly end in this layer, which is called 4C, for reasons best known to the neuro neuroanatomist. But the cells in this layer are strictly monocular, and they are centers surround an organization like geniculate cells. The cells in the upper layers and the layers below have orientation specificity and are simple complex or hypercomplex. So the, the more complicated cells are in the upper and lower layers. The information comes in here, is relayed from this layer to the upper layers and from there to all layers. And the output leaves the cortex for other cortical regions or for the brain stem for various destinations. Uh, the next slide just illustrates uh, an experiment of the sort that shows these orientation columns. If you introduce the electrode here and go obliquely through the cortex for something like three millimeters or so, you change orientation. In, in this experiment, which Torsen and I did in 1961, we went through 53 orientations. We sat for five hours 
uh, neither of us moving from our chairs. It was the first time we had seen anything this patterned. We were fascinated. Luckily, we hadn't had high fluid intake before the experiment because we, we simply didn't get up for five hours. So at two in the morning or whenever we finished, we had gone through all of these orientations. We started with vertical, and as the electrode progressed, we progressed counterclockwise, uh, cell after cell, each one with a new orientation, so that we've gone 100, full 180 degrees by the time we get about here. And we go on and on, and uh, perfectly stepwise, orderly uh, changes. Uh, in all of these years, I've shown these slides many, many times, and I've always wondered if sooner or later someone would ask, what happens? Why did we not see an absence of orientation when we went through layer 4C? Finally, someone did ask. That was Francis Crick, who was apparently one needs to have a certain alertness, I suppose, to ask this question. The answer is we, did, we don't know why. We didn't know at the time that there were cells here that lacked orientation specificity, and I suppose that's the answer. Now, so much then for orientation specificity. There's a high degree of organization in the cortex observing that variable. The second and, and last variable that I want to talk about is ocular dominance, the business of eye preference. And again, if one makes the penetration vertically through the cortex, if the first cell recorded prefers the left eye, then all of the cells will prefer the left eye. If one goes across the cortex like this, one has an alternation of eye preference, so that for about one half millimeter, every cell will prefer the left eye, and then for the next half a millimeter, every cell will prefer the right eye. And it goes alternating back and forth. So this convinced us that there was an aggregation of cells in groups, which in cross-section looked like this, uh, so that one group will prefer one eye, and the next group the next eye. And we have spent a lot of time trying to find out what the geometry of these things is, whether these uh, aggregations seen from above would be parallel stripes or a checkerboard or what. And the, one of the best methods turns out to be to inject one eye with radioactive amino acid, for example, proline. Now, when you inject an eye with radioactive proline, the uh, retinal ganglion cells, along with the other retinal cells, take up the amino acid, and they transport it back to the lateral geniculate body over a period of uh, something like a week. And the uh, uh, radioactive label accumulates in the terminals in the lateral geniculate body, and the next slide shows what this looks like. I haven't spent uh, the next one. Uh, I haven't spent any time on the geniculate, but it's a layered structure and, uh, of six layers which look after alternating eyes. So if, you, if this is the right lateral geniculate in cross-section, this is the result of, of injecting the left eye, and one sees radioactive label in the layers that get their input from the left eye, and the alternating interdigitated set of layers on this side. Well, now, if you wait still longer, enough of this label leaks out of the terminals in the lateral geniculate and is taken up by the postsynaptic cells uh, to be transported up to the cortex, to layer 4C. And then you see the pattern of left and right eye distribution of inputs in layer 4C. Not very much label gets up to 4C, so one has to use dark field techniques to see the label, but the next slide shows what a cross-section looks like. Uh, this is layer 4C, and you can follow it along medially, and this is the part that bends underneath and is folded under. And you can see that the uh, radioactivity occurs in groups, in, in clusters, uh, so that this would be a left eye, if you've injected the left eye, this would be a left eye region, right eye, left eye, right eye, and so on. Just uh, uh, confirming, in a way, the, the neurophysiology. Now, if you want to see what this looks like in uh, face-on view, you can make a, 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 a cut through the cortex like this. And if you cut deep to layer 4C, then obviously 4C will appear as a ring. If, you, if, you, if your cut goes tangential to 4C, it will appear as an oval. And the next slide shows a ring. Uh, that is a, a section that's gone through layer 5. This is layer 4C. And now you can see that this is not a checkerboard, but it is a, peer, a set of parallel bands of, of label. And if you take uh, sections at different levels and cut and glue them together, you can make a montage, which is shown on the next slide. This 
the slide you just saw was this region, but the, the whole montage uh, extending over five or six millimeters or, or more shows the band-like appearance of these uh, stripes. Sometimes they coalesce, but uh, they're not absolutely parallel stripes, but Torsten and I say to each other, this after all is biology, and what else would you, would you expect? Well, the next slide shows a reconstruction of the entire exposed surface of the occipital lobe. This is where we made the cut in the first uh, several slides back. But here we've darkened in every other set of, of these stripes so that the black set would correspond, say, to the left eye and the right set to the right eye. This is one of my fingerprints. And up till a few weeks ago, I used to say it was to scale, but then a colleague pointed out to me that my fingerprint is hardly comparable in size to a credit card, so clearly the scale was off. But uh, at least it shows that there is a certain amount of bifurcating and blind ending in fingerprints, just as there is in ocular dominance columns, though probably for different reasons. The next slide just serves to emphasize that the stripe cortex really is striped like a zebra because one has bifurcations and blind endings of columns, but probably, again, for different biological reasons. Now, if you stop and look at this, first of all, unlike the zebra, the ocular dominance columns are the same width throughout whether for fovea or for periphery. The width is always the same, and it's about one half millimeter. So one millimeter is enough to take you from the left eye to the right eye and back to the left. If you go back to the orientation columns with these progressive shifts as you move across the cortex, again, it turns out that pushing the electrode through one millimeter is more than enough to get you through an entire 180 degrees. Now, what that means is that it, since it takes two millimeters or something like that to get out of one region of visual field into an entirely different region, that's plenty of time to make the entire analysis for all orientations and for both eyes. And that's a very satisfying thing. It would be ridiculous if you only went through a few degrees in going two millimeters because it would mean that part of the visual field would only have the machinery to analyze a certain limited range of orientations and perhaps only for one eye. But the whole thing seems to fit together in a, in a very aesthetically pleasing way, which is illustrated in a kind of caricature shown on the, on the next slide. This block is supposed to illustrate the, the cortex. This would be the surface, and this the white matter. And each of these slabs would be an orientation column. So you'd have vertical here, horizontal, and back to vertical here. These must be slabs. They don't have to be, and they almost certainly are not, parallel planes, as we've illustrated here. They're probably irregular, and they probably swirl. But just it's easiest to draw it as though they were planes, but this would be an elementary unit then of visual cortex, taking in both eyes and all orientations. And one imagines the whole cortex as being a kind of stereotype, monotonous uh, uh, group of these things, probably something like 2,000 for the entire visual cortex. Of course, they're not discrete. You can start at any orientation and end at any orientation, but the machinery must look something like this. And so the cortex seems to be in every way a uniform structure, and it, the, the, the development of the cortex is probably much easier for that reason. Well, I've gone on long enough and perhaps prepared the ground for my colleague to continue on and tell you about deprivation studies. I think the main message of this, though, is that the, the primary visual cortex works in a way that can be comprehended. The most complicated things we see coming out of the visual cortex, of this part of the cortex, are hypercomplex cells. But now you can look at any form in the visual world and predict how cells in the primary visual cortex will respond to that form. They will only respond if the, their receptive fields are intersected by a border, and that border is in the appropriate orientation. Somehow, the rest of the cortex, the rest of the occipital lobe, has to take this information and make something more out of it. And how that's done, at the moment, we simply don't know. And maybe th that will require, for all we know, the next 20 years of going on like oxen.